Welcome to everyone. Thank you for sacrificing, so to speak, the rest of your Sunday to be here with us. Uh, I'm absolutely sure that uh, it's worth it, uh, both with regards to our speaker tonight and the topic we are addressing. But before we start, I would like to convey to everyone the paternal love and blessings of uh, Archbishop Macarius of Australia. Uh, His Eminence is the President of the National Committee for the Bicentenary of the Greek Revolution. And uh, we have made this series, this academic art series, um, with speakers all around Australia, uh, addressing different aspects of the phenomenon we call the Hellenic Revolution of 1821. Thus far, we have had uh, talks in uh, Darwin, in Perth, in Sydney. This one is the fourth talk in that series. We're going to have another one in Sydney, uh, one in Melbourne, and then the last one again in Sydney at the University of Sydney. So all in all, there are going to be seven talks. Usually we think of the Greek Revolution just in terms of uh, Greekness and um, in a more or less narrow uh, perspective. But the Revolution of 1821 has been something of a broader significance, uh, a European and why not a global phenomenon. This is what we are going to uh, see tonight, thanks to uh, Associate Professor Nick Dumanis, who is going to basically contextualize the Greek Revolution. There has been lots of talk about this contextualization of the revolution, uh, and uh, many have um, associated it with uh, the French Revolution, the uh, American Revolution. The thing is basically uh, quite complicated. What do we really mean when we uh, use the term of context? Um, what sort of causations are we aspiring to bring forward? For instance, is the French Revolution the cause of the Greek Revolution? And uh, if it is the cause, what sort of cause is that? If it's not the cause, uh, there's certainly a link, there's certainly an association, a relation between the two phenomena. But what exactly is that? And then again, you know, the issue of contextualization poses other problems. Are we to contextualize the Greek Revolution only with regards to what was happening, uh, let's say, uh, prominently in Western Europe or even on the other side of the Atlantic? Or are we to contextualize it also with what was happening 100, 200, 300 years in the Balkans, in the Ottoman Empire. But these are questions I hope that uh, Professor Dumanis is going to help us and facilitate us to um, address, approach, and why not resolve. Everyone knows uh, Nick. Nick is an associate professor, yeah, more or less, everyone knows Nick. Associate professor at the University of New South Wales, the Department of Modern History. Um, he's a person who has dedicated his um, academic career in researching uh, the Hellenic uh, in a historical sense within its interrelations with uh, other identities, be those the Italian identity, the Ottoman identity, the Turkish identity. Um, his most, I uh, think, uh, if, I'm, if I remember what his most recent research uh, about to be published is a, 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 a global, an overview of the head of Hellenism uh, in the 20th century. And uh, it's uh, done in collaboration with the uh, renowned uh, professor of 
history degree, professor of history at Donizak. We are waiting to read that and I hope it's going to be soon. Now, without further ado, you know, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Professor Dumanis uh, to the podium. I'm going to welcome him as well. And uh, we always yes. here. Yeah. Thank you, Vasily, and thank you to the Archdiocese for this uh, invitation to speak about the, um, the Greek Revolution, the Greek War of Independence. It was a revolution. I'm going to speak very little about the Greeks. Uh, they did come up, but not nearly as much as others, um, because I want to emphasize big picture themes. Trying to place the, what happened in Greece in a much larger um, historical perspective and an international perspective. And there's a very good reason why you need to do that. You must do this, because in 1827, the Greek Revolution had almost run its course. Um, an Egyptian army led by Ibrahim Pasha had suppressed it. Had a few fortresses um, uh, hanging out, um, hanging on, sorry, great, great powers decided at that point to actively intervene um, for various reasons, given disruption to um, trade, etc., the disturbances. Caused by the revolution in the Mediterranean, um, mutual distrust between the great, the great powers, but they decided to intervene. Two years earlier, actually, the great powers were thinking about it. In the summer of 1825, the Greek government at the time tried to get British patronage, and when that failed, they went to the Russians. The Russians were more interested. Once the uh, Russians were interested and the British got thought, oh, uh, we've got to do something about this. So the Duke of Wellington went to Russia to open negotiations, and the result was the Anglo Russian Protocol of the 4th of April 1826, proposing Greece be an autonomous um, principality, I guess, within the Ottoman Empire. That's the first suggestion. But by that point, 1826, the, uh, the Ottomans were actually almost in control of the whole situation. Ibrahim Pasha had, had been um, really quelling the uh, rebellion. So it seemed to muffle the second a, uh, a moot point. But then in 1820, uh, April 1827, young Skabalistias became the new president of Greece and he had good relations with the Russians. And it seemed to get things moving. Um, and uh, the Treaty of London was signed in July 1827 between the British and the Russians. And um, well, the decision was effectively made that Greece should be, because the European powers decided that it should be. Uh, then they came by uh, a compliant European fleet, uh, destroyed the Ottoman fleet very easily um, in the Battle of Navarino, which we all know about. 20th of October 1857, with a loss of 60 out of 89 ships and casualty roster of about 10,000 men. And that's it. Um, that's the, the vision idea of how important the international context is alone, but that's not where I'm going to stop, obviously. There were three agreements after that the Treaty of Adrian Opel, uh, September 1859, the London Convention. May 1832, the Treaty of Constantinople, July 1832, which effectively brought the existence of an independent Greek state, placing it under the protection of the Great Powers. The same thing determined the borders of the state, the nature of its political system, uh, it determined the its rules, Otto, son of Ludwig of Bavaria, not a Greek choice. So for most, most of the rest of the lecture I'm proposing is not to be in Greece at all. I'm going to, talk, I'm going to look at it, the whole situation from a bird, with, a, from, with a bird's eye view to see how it looked from far away and over a longer time period. Um, clearly the Greeks chose a moment in time when the revolution was deemed worthwhile. They chose a time when the revolution was desirable. And they chose a time when it was possible. They could have gone away with it but they didn't need a bit of help anymore. It happened to be a good time.
time because the wall was what we, in the, in the so-called Age of Revolution, my favorite book, the historian Mary Hobson wrote a book called The Age of Revolution, and most people like to use that term, but it was quite revolutionary. I want to talk about what that means. Um, and that, it had been in a revolutionary stage since the, I think since the 1770s. But there was more to it than that, even that. Um, the Greek War of Independence was an international struggle. It marked an international moment. It happened when the idea that there was an international environment was first conceived. It was the first time that we started talking about an international system, an international order. There had been an arrangement of nations since the Treaty of Westphalia. But uh, it's around the 1820s when they started thinking seriously, even in legal terms, about an international system, an international set of rules which the, an international community would abide by. The future as a, uh, its future as a political community was defined by international interest, that is, Greece. And so that's one reason why we ought to look at the international system. But let me look at so some other contexts. See, I like to tell my students that the Romans did conquer the Greeks, but eventually the Greeks um, have a stake in the empire and identified with it to the extent that uh, they became the East Romans, and my, great, my grandfather was Polaropios, which means Roman. So empires have a way of some empires have a way of incorporating the, the people that conquer, making them part of the system. And they have the people that conquer identify with the system. So China, for example, wasn't always that big, but it expanded and the people that lived in it lived in it began to identify with it over a long period of time as the Greeks did with the Roman Empire. It took this revolution that we're talking about here to remind them that they're actually in this rather than Romy. You know, there was, that was the time when the, the switch took place, and it wasn't an easy one. So, why didn't the Greeks become Ottomanized? Now, I've written a book about how Greeks lived under Ottoman rule and how they coexisted, and how they made lives under the Ottoman system, how they could uh, live in it. But they never really were absorbed into it fully. They couldn't be. There was a problem. The thing is, the Ottoman Empire was an Islamic Empire. And as an Islamic Empire, to be a full member, uh, to become a sultan, to become um, a fully fledged member of the political elite, you really had to convert. So many Christians did convert, and they took on the empire. Many of the major figures of the Ottoman Empire were either converts or the children were converts. The person who conquered Greek, uh, Rhodes, for example, in the 1520s, was actually the um, grandson or the son of the, um, of the last visiting emperor. And um, the, the system did have a way of absorbing Greeks, but they had the uh, Christians that they had to convert. Um, but the, you know, the Ottoman Empire always contained a very large Greek Christian minority, particularly in the Balkans. And as Christians, they were never fully uh, absorbed into the system. And that was a problem for the Ottomans by the 19th century. Because by the 19th century, when they were weak, they couldn't count on the loyalty of these minorities, because these minorities were never made to feel part of, that their system was there. That they were always seen as being allowed to exist at, at the pleasure of the other Sultan. Um, so, in other words, the Ottoman Empire could never turn, at least it couldn't bring the Christians into the state and make them feel like it was theirs. Uh, and the biggest, the key to that is um, the only indication we have of that over all those centuries, most of the centuries is that the Greek population, at least, I don't know something about, um, were really keen on prophecies. And they were keen on that, and they all believe very strongly in these prophecies that one day that Christian rule will come back, that either the last Byzantine emperor will come out of uh, the sand or the, the 
walls of Constantinople then will be restored, and he will restore Christian rule. And that in itself tells you that they didn't really identify with the Sultan and his empire um, completely. Now, and that's, and, and that's one reason that the, the, the Ottomans acknowledged this in the late 19th century. After the Greek Revolution, they acknowledged this by trying to reform the system and find a way of getting the Christians to feel part of the system. And they finally changed the constitution in 1908 to give all the Nazis equal rights, but by then it was too late. By then, nationalism, uh, secessionist nationalism was strong. So, one question that historians must ask, which not many people do ask, is why a revolution in 1820 and not earlier? Why not 1720? Why not 1620? What happened if they were never part of this empire? Well, there's an important reason why we that. And that is that the Ottoman Empire was too strong. It was, it was the big show in town. It was the greatest empire. Between 1400, I'll be past that, but, but at least since the fall of Constantinople in 1453, and really up until 1683 when the Turks were laying siege to Vienna, the Ottoman Empire was the strongest empire in the world. If you were a minority living in the strongest empire in the world, you could not rebel against them, and then they had no reason to do that. Um, they would get clobbered, they'd lose their livelihoods, and then what? They tried it. So there wasn't any prospect of it. So what changed? What changed to make secession or rebellion a possibility? They could do nothing whilst the empire was the strongest, the richest, the most militarily powerful state in the world. Now, the thing about the Ottoman Empire is that we tend to look at it through from the vantage point of uh, the 19th century when it was the sick man in Europe. It wasn't very sick at all uh, in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century. It was extremely powerful, extremely efficient, extremely well run by the standards of those years. Um, it was seen as a perfectly well-functioning state compared to the European states, which were always at each other's throats. You can see how it expanded from the darkest reddish colour to the lighter ones. And it did so because it was a state that was capable of mobilising resources much more efficiently than any other state. That it could therefore expand. It had institutions which could keep territories that were conquered. And it could, it had systems where it could, um, it could mobilize, that is, it could tax these places. So it was extremely rich, extremely powerful. The Western Europeans feared the Ottoman Empire. Even in Iceland, I read somewhere, a long time ago, I can't find this reference anymore, of uh, a priest in a, in a, um, in a Icelandic church beseeching God to keep the Turk away. This is a nice point. And you know, during the Reformation, the Turks were seen as the one of in Albrecht Dürer's depictions of the Apocalypse, one of the horsemen, the military one, I think, or the, the war figure, has a turban on the Ottoman. There's, there's a great fear of the Turks. Whilst, and, you know, for all the Greeks, therefore, Christians, all Christians, all minorities, lived under the Ottomans, had no choice. They had to live under, under this system and uh, didn't even really think about it. If, uh, uh, why would you? What would, you know, there wasn't a prospect of it. Um, some of the Greek Orthodox Christians lived under the Ottoman rule um, in the uh, Ionian Islands. They, were never, they never were under the Ottoman rule, under the Venetian rule. But most of the Greek world Greek world was in Greece, and uh, much of the Eastern Mediterranean <coughs> lived essentially under Ottoman rule. And they found ways of living in it, and many of them thrived. Uh, they found ways of working with the system. There was a place for them in the system, I must add. Um, the Milan system in the 19th century had its 
criticism before whereby the, the Greek Christians were acknowledged by the Ottoman Sultan and had a place within it. Um, so, but something changed, and it changed in the 1700s. Now we take it for granted that Europe rise, no, really, sorry, rose, but Europe rose. We take it for granted. Um, there are historical reasons for why Europe became the center of world power. If you think about it, Europe is on the edge of Eurasia. It's on the periphery. It always struggled in the past to be part of the great movements, the great trade movements, the great political centers of the world. Western Europe was always on the margins, but by the 1700s it became a center. And I'm not going to, uh, this is a very good of course, I'm explaining why this is the case, but um, some things that happened in Europe um, over the last previous few centuries, particularly since the discovery of the Americans, where they walked in and plundered uh, two continents, uh, took a lot of its gold, etc. Um, but the European world also got its act together. Now, I just a bit earlier, I talked about how the Ottomans were well organized and capable of demonstrating their power and showing and building their great empire. The Europeans found better ways. And, they found, and um, one of the things they did was that the, um, a little state like Britain or France, for example, they became more centralized bureaucratically. Fiscally, that means that the taxation systems were became more rational. The state could collect more resources, mobilize more resources, and I think it probably be often as I'll explain in a minute why. With the, they needed to do that because the Europeans were fighting each other constantly since the Reformation. Religious wars kind of, was one reason why they kept fighting each other, but it honed their 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 uh, their ability to fight wars that were not that became monster military machines. I mean, the clearest case of this was um, France. Uh, when once it had its revolution and it, and it really consolidated all these great forms of rationalizing the system, the systems and introducing bureaucratic methods, they had so much money they also they, they were able to conquer most of Europe under Napoleon. Nobody really could stop Napoleon on their own. They rationalized their military systems. Now, why am I talking about all this? The Ottomans had done this. The Asian states had done this. The Europeans had done it. They were doing it by fighting each other and having their skills. And in the meantime, they also conquered colonies um, in the Americas and uh, bits of Asia and Africa. And uh, they become extremely rich. By the mid-1700s, the Europeans actually were dominant in the world. It happened because things changed in Europe. Not because it was natural, not because they were Protestants or uh, individualists or any of that rubbish that we were taught at school a long time ago, uh, that they had some kind of cultural way with all. Historically, they became more powerful. And the rest of the world, particularly China and the Ottomans and India, had not changed and were calling out. The Ottoman Empire, whilst the Europeans were becoming more centralized and powerful, the Ottoman Empire became more fragmented, internally more, uh, the ruling the empire became more cumbersome, regional warlords became more powerful. Uh, we've all heard of Ali Pasha. Ali Pasha was dominant in what is uh, Ibero, Albania. He was an Ottoman um, potentate who defied the rule of the Sultan, but he wasn't the only one. Many of them were doing that. The Sultan really wasn't very powerful by this point, by 1800. The Ottomans are finding it very hard to run their show to mobilize resources and to do things properly. Now, the turning point came when an orthodox power, the Russians, crushed the Ottomans 
in the, 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 the one of a series of Rosso Turkish wars, but this one was the big one, 1768 to 1772, when the Russians, using their modern armies with modern weaponry, with large armies, defeated the Turks. And they got edged closer and closer. In fact, they got, they got access to the Black Sea. Once you get access to the Black Sea, Constantinople is completely vulnerable. The Russians would continue to do this. Edge closer and closer. Now what that did in the Ottoman Empire is two things. The Ottomans suddenly got the shock of their lives. Until that point, they didn't think there was a problem. Suddenly they realized we are weak. And we don't have answers to dealing with European power. The second thing that happens is that the Greeks living within the Ottoman Empire suddenly realize that the empire that they live in is vulnerable, that Christian empires are more powerful, and therefore there's an opportunity there. That there's another world that they can identify with that they can attach themselves to. This is a very significant point which it really needs emphasis. It means that in Greek minds, the world had changed in their favor, that suddenly they didn't really need to rely on prophecy and on God to actually the thing to do things for them. The Russians, the British, the French, the Germans, they were much more powerful than the Turks now. They could align themselves. And they also, this is the other, the third important point which I mentioned earlier, because this part of the world is powerful, you start to identify with it and start to be influenced by it. It's a bit like us and America. You, who do you look up to? Do you look up to the United States because it's the most powerful state and it exerts, a, as, an, as a result, it exerts a great deal of soft power. So those people inside, you know, the Ottoman Empire looked to the Europeans and thought, that's the way forward. So you, the Europeans presented a, 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 um, a paradigm of modernity of the future. And Greece within the empire started to look at that as a possibility of their own future. Now I'm not saying that all Greeks started to think about ratting on the Ottomans. They didn't. But the idea starts. The possibility of breaking with the Ottoman Empire is there. Now, the thing about Europe is that it's um, it is a paradigm. It's also a place where there are lots of Greeks too. Really. There, there is a Greek diaspora that are living in Odessa, in Vienna, in London, in um, various parts of Russia, some are serving in the Russian court. Now, the Greeks are everywhere as merchants, some uh, as doing natural things in that. So they're part of that world. In a way, these Greeks are, are the liaisons between the Ottoman Empire and Europe. The European, the, the Turks look to these Greeks mainly to understand these new, this new force in Europe. They had always done that, actually. They relied on that Armenians for the other side of the empire, for the Persia and that, uh, everything in that direction, but the Greeks were the main intermediaries um, with this new burgeoning powerful part of the world. <coughs> but the Greeks also, like I said, start to look at the Europeans and how they dressed and how they did things and how they did their houses and how they behaved and they started to pick up these things. Well, this is this soft power. This is where Europe as a concept becomes important. They don't, they don't assume that Europe meant anything to them before that. Particularly when the Ottomans were so ultra powerful and Western Europe was this place of um, Protestants and Catholics who Catholic and Greeks didn't like anyway. Um, didn't really have much to offer. Now they did. So this is the Europe that, start, that would eventually intervene to help the Greeks by the 1820s. 
they would overcome, they would actually dispatch the Ottoman military mark quite easily, as they did in 1827. The question is, why should Europe do that? We understand why the Greeks look to Europe, but why would Europe look to the Greeks? How did that happen? The Europeans, the Europeans look to Greece, start to look to Greece for inspiration as well, but not current Greece. It's the Greek past. See, if you're the new great center of power in the world, if the Europeans now dominate the world, which they were doing by 1800, very easily, they were easily conquering the empires. They were wondering, why are we so powerful? What brought us here? They started to think about their own uh, um, uh, prominence, prominence, sorry, you know, what made them so good. And they looked to Greece. Greece was an important source of their own sense of the, their new identity as a Europe. And there's a reason for that. Firstly, Europe was in a revolutionary situation. I want to explain a concept before I move on, before I talk about Phil Hellenism. Between 1770, 1770 and 1820s, say, Europe was at that point where it was also it was powerful in the world, but it was also changing itself. It was in a revolutionary situation. Now, the revolution is not a good word, actually. Revolution means coming back to the same point. It's a very conservative thing. But, but the meaning taken is that everything's turned upside down. Okay, things that uh, old paradigms are taken and broken. And that is something that doesn't happen very often in history. It's we bang the word revolution too too often. A revolution is something that happens only in extreme circumstances. It takes a lot for a people to overthrow the government. You know, they'll take a lot of. Um, Pressure before they, they try taking that drastic step. But Europe was in that situation in the late, 19, late 18th century, early 19th century. It was an era in which, I can't go into this, but Europe itself had changed. Um, there was a growing group of people, we call them the bourgeoisie, the middle classes. They were expanding in number and they wanted a say in the running of society. But they had no say because people who ran society were people who were born to rule. The aristocracy. It was a privileged group. It was a locked shop. It was some, only some people got to do things. And everything was in accordance with tradition. We call it the ancien regime, the old regime. Okay? Now, if you're personal ability, you've come up, you've made money, you're a liberal, you, uh, you're a merchant, you, you're taking interest in your society, you want to have a say. So, at some point in the late 19th century, particularly when old regimes were in great economic difficulty, the system bust broke down. That happened in France in 1789, but it happened a bit earlier in the Americas. The Americas are important to Greek history. In the Americas, firstly, the British colonists revolted against British rule, not because they wanted to be ruled differently, but for tax reasons. And when they won their revolution, they had to figure out how do we rule ourselves? How do we rule ourselves? We, we can't bring in the king, creating, how do we, how do, we do that? You know, how, do you, how do you pick somebody to be a king, a monarchy? They decided to look to the past and look to tradition, the Greeks and the Romans, and found inspiration and created a republic. They broke the paradigm. And then, once the Americans did it, the floodgates opened. Not, actually, it's not a good metaphor because it took a while before Haiti, but then other, group, other nations broke away. But the, the old system of monarchy, of all the rules, 
local bank of aristocracy to bring everything to smash. And the Greeks became important at that point. Philhellenism becomes an important theme at this point. Now, Philhellenism is important. I'm not going to talk about the Greeks who got east and the Greeks who were overseas. I'm going to talk about the non-Greeks who looked to Greece and were inspired by what happened in 1821. So inspired that some of them risked their lives. Some, many of them flocked to Greece to fight. They were useless, but. You know, they, they, they were keen and they, they brought a lot of attention to Greece. They actually were good at raising money. Greece becomes important as, a, a, as, a, as part of this revolutionary, um, in this big revolutionary culture that had developed since the 1770s, but particularly in the 1820s, Greece was the centre of world attention. And the reason for that is that Greek, the Greek Revolution happened at a moment when Europe was trying to turn back the clock to become traditional again. It defeated Napoleon five years earlier, seven years earlier, six, eight years earlier, actually. And the European monarchies were back in charge and they were trying to get everybody to forget about constitutions and liberties and, and uh, freedoms and and all the ideas of the French Revolution. They were trying to get around to shut up. They were imposing censorship. They had a secret police trying to weed out subversives, and there were many subversives. The subversives tended to be the children of aristocrats who were going against their fathers, who were radicals. They all were inspired by Greece. Greece was in the air in Europe and in the air Greece was the centre of attention. Everyone was talking about it. And the, the reason being is that there were all these people who were interested in progressive ideas and they read it into the Greek Revolution. Most of those people who were fighting the Greek Revolution would have been known what they were talking about. So I'm talking about what the outsiders read into the Greek Revolution, what it meant to them. Why Greece? Because Greece, by that point, represented progressive values. It re represented difference. Something, um, it, I, I explained this. This is the era also of enlightenment. The, the 18th century was the, that era, era when all those tradition, the ideas of tradition were broken. When everybody, well, intellectuals, philosophers, all sorts of people were trying to figure out the world again. Mm. And we're trying to do that without using the hand of God to explain everything, but putting man at the centre. So it was a, a thoroughly Greek thing to do. This is what the Greek 5th century was about. It was trying to explain everything by science, by mathematics, by philosophy. It was an invitation to think. In Europe, there was an explosion of ideas and the implementation of these ideas, which is part of that breaking of those paradigms of the old regime. But it was the Greeks that provided most of the inspiration. There was a Greek mania in the educated, amongst the educated classes of Europe. They were besotted with Greek life, with Greek ideas, with everything Greek. It was the enlightenment where you come up with new disciplines, philosophy, uh, not, philosophy's not new, uh, but you know, economics. Um, Try to figure out how the economy worked. Sociology really has its um, origins in the, in the enlightenment. Um, rethinking everything, and the Greeks provide all the inspiration, including the idea of constitutional governance. Now, what do you do when you can't have a ruler? Or what if you want to limit what, what happens when you want to make the people sovereign, give them power? How do they rule themselves without a ruler who has a mandate from God? You have to write up a constitution. How do you define the rights of the people? You have to draw up a constitution to define their rights. 
that way they become solid. It was in the Enlightenment when they start to think about challenge the very idea. The idea of sovereignty comes up. Sovereignty. Who has power? Where does that power, the right to that power, come from? In the past, it was easy. It came from God to the ruler. The Vasilevs, the, the ruler of the Byzantine Empire, the rightly Byzantine Empire, had power because of his relationship with God. But what happens when you change that and you, you pass that sovereignty to the people, la nation, what happens? How did, how did, you know, where does their right come from? Or how do you find it? It was in this period when the idea of transferring sovereignty from the ruler to the people happens. In France, they cut the king's head off. In 1776, the Americans revolt and create their own nation state. This is important. This is the, because we didn't know the world nation states. There weren't any before. The French in 1789 follow suit, but then all of the Americans follow suit, but the Greek Revolution happens within the context of a global revolution, much of which takes place in the Americas. Spanish, Prince, you know, Spanish um, uh, colonies breaking away, being inspired by the Ameri by America, and creating their own republics. All of them inspired by classical Greece and classical Rome. Just as a drinks break, the Greeks had their own enlightenment too. They were part of this system. It was in this period when Greeks were in Europe during the Enlightenment, during the revolutionary period, imbibing these ideas, taking them on, but applying them in their own context. This is when um, Corais, uh, who was a witness of the French Revolution, I think he's the father of Gathar this is, you know, this is the this is the important moment. This is when the when the when these Greek elites decide it's important that we restore our name as Edenus, replace Romir with Edenus, bring back the word Greek, jettison the old word Roman. Takes a long time, but the, the Greek Enlightenment is an important chapter. I'm not going to cover it. One final thing, I'm, I'm talking very big sweeping terms, but uh, this is, a, this is, I think, is crucial, crucially important as to why the Europeans decided to support the Greeks in their revolt against the Turks, which was decisive. The late 18th century and the early 19th century sees the rise of the so-called public sphere. German German philosopher Jürgen Habermas uh, raised it, um, defined it, but it's an important concept. It's the public sphere is when the people, when the society dis discusses things amongst itself, rather than allowing everything to be decided within a small group around the king, where the politics and the affairs of the nation um, are restricted to that small group. In Britain, in France, and other parts of Europe. That is no longer the case. Sure, the decisions are taken by a small group, but also by parliaments. But, but there's a society developing. Literate people, circles of readers, engaged in debate, where they talk about all things, what our society should be like. They debate the merits, the drawbacks of revolution, and all sorts of things, but they get to talk. That public thing, the public sphere is new. At least in modern times, the ancient Greek world had, had a public sphere too. The Romans had a public sphere. But in the Middle Ages, it disappeared. Power was the business of the king and the aristocracy. Now, there's a public sphere. And what were the public on about? Well, one of the things that we're always talking about was Hellenism. They were reading the classics. 
So why support the Greeks? Why would Claude Byron dress like that? Why were they so besotted? I mean, some of them were we. It was a madness for some of them. Shirley said, we are all Greeks now. What the hell is that? You know, it just shows you how big it was for them, how much it meant something to them. I mean, think about it. If you look at Washington today, or any Martin place, any, a lot of the great government buildings or law buildings, they've got Greek columns. It's a legacy of this mania for heaven. Phil Hedlund. So, why support the Greeks? There were three reasons. The Americans did. The Greek Revolution was very popular in revolutionary America. It's the first Haiti is a bit for the first American country. It's in the Americas to um, recognize the Greek Revolution. Haiti. It's also because um, there was a movement too, which I can't go into, the nation state, nationalism. The French found this new thing, the Americans actually, that it's better rather than be empires to be a nation. That it's better for a progressive people to be organized in the nation state. And Greece was fighting to become a nation. So that's another reason why they supported the Greeks. There is the other reason which I've already talked about, that the Greeks were a special case. That many European, Europeans really believed that they were spawned by Greeks, that their image takes them to the Aegean. You know, there were people like Winkelmann and others who, were, who did a lot of work to um, establish Re-established the classics, classical art, the study of ancient Greek. In that being right, they were studying Greece much more than anyone in the Greek world was studying. In Greece, they saw all the values that they were aspiring to. The, the, their idealistic values about politics, about society, about culture. They were all well read in the classics. This is not a new thing, but it was a main one. And the Europeans were good at this. They loved it. They loved the Greeks. They loved it so much, they appropriated it. They made it theirs. If you look at a lot of the paintings, like this one, which I still haven't figured out who did this one, somebody in the audience like that. It looks like a, a, a scene from Northern Europe. But in the Greek, in the, in the Phil Hellenic imagination, that's the Greek world. It was, I mean, there, are, there is some evidence to suggest that it was wetter and, and um, there was more greenery in Greece, uh, in the Greek world back then, but not, not for that extent. That looks like an English landscape. They showed you that the Philhellenes often didn't know anything about actual Greeks, but they were in love with the, their idea of Greece particularly the ancient Greeks. It was a movement. It was literary, it was artistic. Uh, there's a lot of people who you could uh, name who were um, identified as Philhellenes and their Philhellenism was reflected in their artistic production. Painters, uh, writers, etc. Poets. I'm still not going to talk about what Byron and when the Greek War of Independence happened, this is where the public sphere happens. The newspapers were constantly writing about it. It was front and center. That was a matter of debate. People were discussing it all the time. It was a passion. I can't think of uh, maybe the last year where we were all watching TV wondering what's going on in America. Um, might be um, comparable, I don't know, but, you know, Europeans were on the edge of their seat wondering what's going to happen to the Greek revolt. 
what's going to happen to these great gallant bricks, you know, they'll always be one sided. I don't hear, I don't think there was anyone supporting the Turks at the time. I mean, it helped that a lot of the fellow Hellenic Hellenes were celebrities, people who were well known, people who, you know, who counted as, as major figures in all areas of life, including Chateaubriand, uh, Eugene Delacroix, who already a famous painter, um, famous politicians like Albert Norman, Aaron Weiss, uh, Byron Shelley, were famous already, Mary Shelley. Uh, some became famous as a result of their engagement with the Greek Revolution, uh, either actively or simply as promises for it, like uh, Jean-François Maxime uh, Rivol. Committees were formed that gathered money. You know, they, they, were, they raised money, uh, or they, they made representations to leaders, to the Tsar of Russia. Um, women, in particular, were very keen on the Greek Revolution. It, it, uh, if they were, you know, romanticism is another thing, but the, the Greek Revolution was a romantic movement of people struggling for freedom. And uh, many readers, including women, including extremely important women in, in aristocratic circles, um, did their best to gather money to support the Greeks. Uh, there was the, the London Philip Hellenic Committee, which raised a lot of funds in 1824, and again in 1825, uh, although it was a loan. Very important. These loans had to be repaid, but it wasn't a gift. Um, not like Ethiopia carrying the money to give it to them. This is a lot. It says a lot about Britain at the time. Um, one of the reasons why nobody was supporting the other side is because the Islamic world was the Benoit. It was the op op opposition. It wasn't. I mean, it wasn't clear that they actually thought the Ottomans were legitimate. Or a legitimate state. You know, why should we think about the Sultans? And who are these Muslims and barbarians that they thought? They thought of them as barbarians as, as backward. By this point, they were backward. Why would we support them against these Greeks who are the descendants of these people who are so ignorant? So there was this what we call Orientalism was it in in effect. You know, uh, that it was. You know, taking sides for that reason as well, that was also an opposition to, to the Islamic world. Um, an important point uh, that comes up though is that it's ultimately, you know, public opinion then is there and it pressures the political elites. It's a pressure thing. I'm not 100% sure anymore that it's, it's the decisive thing. It's important. It sets the atmosphere. But then, at some point, the real politics, the the uh, the real interests of each of the great powers, starts to weigh in. Into, should we let this thing happen? Now, you know, why would the states of Europe, after Napoleon, after having crushed Napoleon, have the cracking crushed the revolution, have, after having restored the old regime, trying to turn back the clock, trying to get everyone to forget about progressive values, to allow kings and the people who are born to just simply resume the place and we just turn back the clock and have things as they were before. Why would they support the Greeks? After all, the Greeks were revolting against a ruler of long standing, the Sultan. It's a legitimate authority. Wouldn't that go against their principles? But they did go against their principles. I mean, why would they? You know, they were, the European powers were very uh, disturbed by the fact that much of the Americas was breaking away and forming republics, and, and that their influence was in cities, would be an insidious influence on Europe. But they decided to intervene. Because by that point, the European states, including France, had to now really think 
how about how to organize their affairs. They've just been in the bloodiest war, um, European continental war since the early 17th century, that is the Thirty Years' War. The Napoleonic Wars were shocking. Shocking in terms of the toll, the devastation caused, the what it caused to trade, what it was doing to, to, to mercantile trade, and this ongoing conflict was good. And also, how do we make sure that stability is restored so we can get on with things and make sure that the Russians don't get their way in Eastern, Eastern Mediterranean? The Greek revolt became an issue for deciding on an international system, on an international order. It's the first time we really hear, a little bit after actually, where we start to hear the word international. International is a word that is invented in this period, and it's the Greek case that becomes the test point. You know, the, the, cent the, the, the central case study of this issue of international stability. So the Europeans decided that it was the first of a series, of, you know, it, it would work too. It, it's the first of a series of interventions which the Europeans would make into the affairs of another country. Okay, so this, because the Greek revolt is a domestic issue within that within a particular country, a sovereign power for the Ottoman Empire, being there for The Europeans had to justify intervention. They discussed, and this is the first time we also hear about humanitarian intervention. I don't know if they use the actual term, but they tried to use humanitarian reasons to intervene on behalf of the Greeks with that public pressure behind them to make things happen. They also start to talk about, is the Ottoman Empire legitimate? Should we, should we actually consider its interests at all? So, it's these considerations which force the Europeans to act in 1827. The desire, for an international system to impose international stability between great powers, using the excuse of Greek, of, of, of Hellenism and Philhellenism, to intervene and end the Greek revolt and impose a solution. And what kind of solution did they impose? It wasn't the progressive principles that were driving the Philhellenism. No. It was the principles that it were of interest to the old regime powers. They made Greece a monarchy. They imposed a ruler from Central Europe who wouldn't change his religion. He remained Catholic. He had his own army. They drew Greece's borders. They to a large extent determined the constitution. One of the big decisions they made is that Otto was king of the Greeks rather than Greece. So there was an element of sovereignty there. It was the Greeks. And if you can see in this painting by Peter von Hess in 1839, at the moment when Otto arrives to assume his uh, throne, uh, I note the, um, the soldiers here in the corner my, uh, it's not here. You can see the soldiers in the corner there. The foreign powers, Greece already had a debt to pay on its inception. The money collected by those committees in London, they had already paid a debt. And Greece was an independent country, but a dependency of great powers, particularly in Britain. And that's how its history began, and that's how its history continues. Thank you.